pretty good intro music, actually. Who chose that, Stephen? Thank you. Jeez, that right. I'm going to fall over this at some point. Absolutely nailed on. Try not to. Um, so this afternoon, I, I thought I would try and talk about a few different things and weave one common thread uh, through them. Um, there'll be a little bit about me. That's kind of inevitable, I suppose, in my journey as an entrepreneur. There'll be a bit about Orange Bus, a company I founded um, with a chap called Mike Parker some 12 years ago now. But I also want to talk about the concept of luck. And uh, this is something that has kind of interested me for a while. People often look at me and say that I've been a, a fortunate chap, and I certainly feel very lucky. Um, I have a lovely family. I'm very happy. I've achieved a lot of the things I, I set out to achieve when I was a young man. A lot of the, the material things that I thought were very important um, I've now achieved. But I've also had some fairly uh, difficult times, so, some things that I call unlucky breaks. I've had a couple of those in particular that I will mention today. Um, if you, anybody, if you ever look in, if you look into luck, if anybody, if you ever do any research into luck, this chap tends to come up, Richard Wiseman. Uh, he's a fascinating fella. And, and actually, his first bit of research that I came across was a piece of work where he did some, um, he did an experiment with a bunch of people who half of them considered themselves to be lucky and the other half considered themselves to be unlucky. And he had some set criteria as to which box he put them in. He gave them all a newspaper and set them a task and said, I want you to count the adverts that appear in this newspaper, and if you get it right, there's a cash reward at the end of it. It turned out on page three, there was an advert that said, there are 289 adverts in this newspaper. Please go and collect your money and go home. The lucky people overwhelmingly found that advert. And what I was fascinated by was that the unlucky people didn't. And the reasons being that Richard came up with, and it's one of these uh, four principles of of lucky people is that unlucky people are people who think that they're unlucky. It's a state of mind thing, and they get very focused on the task at hand. They're not open to new opportunities. They don't turn bad luck into good, uh, and they don't maximize things that happen to them as, by chance. So I've looked at that and thought, how does that apply to my career and the things that have happened to me over the, over the years? And, and hopefully I've got a few stories around that today. So I'll start when I was a young man. Um, I was very much into graffiti. I was 14, 15, 16. Uh, it became a big part of my life. And um, I was very opinionated as a young man. And I thought that the best way to get my opinions across around things like the pool tax or what music you should listen to was to paint them in six foot high letters, usually in pink or purple around the transit system of the region. Um, I thought I was doing all the commuters of the, of the region a favor by brightening up the journey to work. I certainly didn't think anybody would mind. And uh, it, it actually turns out these guys mind quite a lot. Um, that was my, uh, my notice of fine from North Tyneside Magistrates Court, if you can make that out. Princely sum of £130.75, pence, including costs by instalments of £3 every week. And that was in 1991. Now, the, the key thing here, and I guess this was um, my first lucky break in a way, or unlucky break, is that uh, I was 18 when I was charged, so I just passed my 18th birthday, and that's significant for two reasons. One is you get tried as an adult. The other one is I was doing my A-levels at the time, and this became a massive distraction to me. I was faced with the genuine prospect of going to prison. Two of my friends went to prison that year, one for 18 months and one for 12 months. And this changed their lives forever. There's no doubt about it. That had a huge impact on their lives. And had it happened to me, there was no way I would have probably ended up the way that I did. It, it would have been catastrophic. But for whatever reason, um, I got away with it more than they did. And I was given the opportunity to still go and get my degree. Unfortunately, because this had such a big impact on my A-levels, the two A's and a B that I was predicted to get into the London School of Economics kind of didn't happen. And I got a D in two E's and ended up at Bradford Nilkley Community College which isn't quite as prestigious as the LSE, I have to be honest. Um, it, it's affiliated to Bradford University. That's where I told my mum I was going. Uh, and I still got, I got a business degree. But Bradford College um, became better known as, as Rave School to, to me and my friends. Uh, this is the early 90s, and we were um, very much interested in going out and partying. Raves were um, kind of just coming out of the illegal scene um, and, and into the kind of inner city areas and... Um, into illegal events. 
And I really got involved in this in a big way. And I met some people in Bradford called uh, Activate, a collective called Activate, who had been putting on illegal raids uh, on the Ilkley Moors for a number of years. And for one of their first forays in illegal, um, legal, illegal night, they did an all-nighter, and they booked me to do some graffiti. I got paid in some free tickets and some other stuff. And uh, it was great. I had a brilliant night. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I liked the guys. They were good fun. And they didn't know a lot about business, if I'm honest. So I kind of got more and more involved um, with the events and helped them organize things, helped try and bring the break-even point down and, and stuff like that. And I thought, this is great. Everything we touch turns to gold. In reality, we had the only all-night license in West Yorkshire. So to be quite honest, you could put anything on on a Saturday night if you've got that license, and chances are people are going to turn up. I missed that point. So I thought I would go and do something in Leeds with a different friend of mine. We'd go make some proper money, go where the posh kids are. And uh, we picked a night at a venue called The Music Factory. The Music Factory was hugely popular at the time. It, it had two nights. One was Back to Basics, one was Up Your Onsen, both very well known still to this day. They were Friday and Saturday, so we picked Thursdays. Thursdays were popular with students. Let's do the, we'll do the student night. That's our target market. What we didn't do was any research. We just thought we were great at this, and whatever we do, again, we'll turn to gold. And had we done some research, we would have noticed that the actual night that we'd chosen was right smack bang in the middle of Leeds University exams. And it turns out that even students aren't stupid enough to go out and get wasted the night before a big exam. So it was a disaster. And I learned a couple of things that night. One is, don't get cocky. The other one was a little bit scarier. I was left at 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of a nightclub, which had then closed in, in Leeds, owing somewhere in the region of £5,000 to the head of security and the venue owner. And these aren't the sort of people you really want to owe money to when you're a 21-year-old student who is broke. I thought I was going to get at least that money over the door that night, and I could pay them easily. So I had my first lesson in negotiation, which was negotiating, can I get out of there alive, I think. Uh, and, and I managed to persuade them to give me until noon the next day to come up with the cash. So I went back to my student pad. I, uh, I didn't sleep, funnily enough. Rang my mum and dad as soon as I thought it was reasonable to do so at about 7 o'clock and asked them to urgently transfer some money over and I would tell them why later. Um, which they did and, and uh, I paid the debt off. Unfortunately, this meant when I left university, I had some debt. I owed my mum and dad some money and I'd been largely debt free up until then, so it was quite frustrating for me. So I needed a job and I needed a job quickly. So I got home, I had a, I got a two two in my degree, so not, you know, it, was, it was okay, I kind of scraped by, I hadn't been in very often, so it was fair enough. And I don't think you can do that now, to be honest, I, I, you can't get away with that. But um, I came home and I was looking for a job, and I, and I, I got offered, I, got, I went for two interviews very, very quickly. One was with Adidas, to work as a sales rep, and I'm an Adidas collector, still am today, have been for, for as long as I could buy trainers. And the other one was with a meat company, so one was my dream job. You can see where this is going, can't you? I got a job in a meet, dead glamorous, and uh, you know, imagine this is a chat-up line in the pub, what do you do for a living? Oh, I sell meat, brilliant, I'll be talking to some other people over there. Um, so this was a, it was a really interesting job, actually. These guys were traders, they bought large quantities of meat from around the world, so 20, 30, 40 tonnes. They would break it down in the UK and sell it to caterers, one, two tonne at a time. I learned about creating a market, about forward buying. You had to get your prices right. It was low margin, high volume, high risk, because people went out of business a lot. And if you lost, a customer went out of business and you hadn't spotted it, and you'd only made 2% margin, it was hard to get that money back from another deal. I also, unfortunately, had a really negative experience with the guy that owned it. Um, he was a bully. He was a nasty piece of work. And one day, he would shout at everybody on a daily basis, and one day, he picked on me while I was on the phone to a client, and I was busy negotiating over a problem that he had with the delivery. He had every right to complain, um, but it would have been okay, he was a good customer. Unfortunately, my boss was in the background screaming and shouting about what this guy could go and do to himself, how we weren't going to give nothing to anyone, and uh, so on and so forth. So I put the phone down, and I was about to try and reason with my boss that this wasn't the right thing to do, and he threw his phone at me, and it hurt. Uh, phones were massive then. Um, so I learned, I, I, I took that to be, I was fired, by the way, so we had a very short argument and I left, and um, uh, I, I subsequently actually took him to court and won, so it was quite good, I enjoyed that one. But I learned uh, on that one, if I ever become the boss, if I'm ever in that position of responsibility, treat people with respect, you know, don't, don't be a twit. 
Fortunately, because I won that little kind of uh, legal battle, I had a little bit of money this time, and I didn't need to take the first job that came to me. So I spent a little bit of time looking around, trying to work out the things that I was genuinely interested in. And whilst technology in itself hadn't necessarily played a big part in my life up to now, um, I had built a website, or I'd been involved in building a website for the meat company. It was called MeatWeb. So, <sighs> and I'm up all night thinking of that one. Uh, I don't think it still exists. I don't know why. I thought it would be a really valuable domain name, wouldn't it? Um, so, I, so, so I started looking around for technology jobs, and there was, a, there was a job came up with a little IBM business partner in Sunderland, about 10 staff. Uh, I went along, handed my CV in, direct, sort, of, sort of in person, got, met the sales director, got on really well with him. He was a great guy. And for whatever reason, he offered me the job. I had no qualifications to do it. I didn't know anything about the stuff that we were selling, but I really enjoyed it. So this was me entering, that isn't me, I, I, this was me entering the world of the IBM business partner. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned different skills in this one. These were deals that lasted sort of six months, nine months to build. They were half a million pound to a million pound in value. They had hardware, they had professional services, they would have sometimes a software element. It was complicated, but you had to build relationships with people, you had to build trust. I moved from the small business partner up to the biggest in the UK, actually, and I started to make some money, and some, some real money for the first time in my life. This is brilliant. It allowed me to fulfill, I guess, my, one of my pleasures in life, which I, I, was, I was very active in the mod scene at the time, so this chap here looks resplendent in his blue suit. And I would also I'll get tailor-made suits. I thoroughly enjoyed that. But I did have a problem with the conformity. I had a problem with the authority and being told what to do and when all the time. Anyway, the, the scooter scene and the, and the mod scene was very important to me. And this is kind of leading up to my next big unlucky break, if you like. So I, I traveled around Europe on the scooter. That's outside the San Siro, minus the one on the left. Uh, we rode from Newcastle all the way down to Italy and then back up through France. So we rode over the Swiss mountains, which we missed when we were planning this. Didn't notice them on the map. So, <laughs> so they came as a surprise when we got there in, in, in Harrington jackets with sunglasses on. And it was snowing. Um, but we somehow made it into Italy, got that great photo, made our way home. And I used to ride my, my, my scooter everywhere. Unfortunately, one day, I rode it into a car. Uh, and um, that was clearly a life-changing event, right? I mean, the, the, the car won. I know it looks pretty bad on that picture of the car, but um, it, it very much won that argument. Um, so I say unlucky break. On this one, uh, I spent a long time in hospital. I was two months in hospital. Uh, I then had four months in a wheelchair and a good year or two of recovery afterwards, to be honest. But the thing that was lucky was that the combined speed of me and the car coming together put me in that hedge. And what I subsequently found out from the police was that had it been two or three miles an hour either way, I either would have landed on the road or the grass in front of the hedge or in the ploughed field behind it. And both of those events at the speed that we were travelling would probably have killed me. Apparently. The, 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 the point of impact, which breaks everything from there down, which is what happened to me, isn't the bit that kills you. It's, it's when you land and your internal organs get smashed about in your head and everything else. So I had this beautiful soft landing. Apparently, it took them a while to find me. They, they actually couldn't find where I was. I can't remember any of this, thankfully. So this is my, a big life-changing event. Um, you know, I had all of this time to recuperate. I did go back to work, and I found it difficult. I struggled a little bit. I really wasn't as motivated as I used to be. So I did what most young people would do in this point, is I had a few shandies. Uh, I went on holiday, actually. That's what that's meant to symbolize. Uh, I went to Thailand with my then girlfriend, now my wife, and, um, and we spent a lot of time sort of thinking about what I wanted to do in the future. She'd always been a brilliant supporter. And I said, look, I don't want to do this anymore. I need to do something else. It's time to get out of corporate life and do something that's a bit more about me, uh, something that I can enjoy and get behind. So I came home rang my boss and told him I was leaving, sent the keys back to the company car, and I needed a vehicle. And I just went out and thought, well, what, what can I buy? What's practical? And that was when I found that, the, the 1973 VW camper van. I actually went back to university, and I concentrated this time because I was paying for it, and I did a master's. And, uh, and, and as in, in, a, in order to kind of keep, keep the bills paid, I did a little bit of consultancy, and, and I would drive from one client to another. Uh, in the orange bus. And I, I rapidly became known as Julian with the orange bus. And I, I quite liked that. It gave me an identity. It gave me a way of standing out in what was a very busy crowd. 
very quickly, I got asked if, if I could build websites, and I used to subcontract work out to people who could. I certainly couldn't. Um, and Orange Bus was a brand that started to stick. And actually, what I found is it, it got me some PR, because newspaper editors and magazine publishers, they liked the fact that they had a good picture. You know, business photos are often a bit dull. Uh, you know, people in a suit with a laptop, uh, it's not that exciting. You stick a camper van in there, and as it says on the, on the front cover, it's orange and it's fun. So I suddenly realized that I had something there that it wasn't really by plan, it wasn't by design, but I had an opportunity to build on this brand. So I created Orange Bus IT, as it was at the time. Around about this time, I also I got offered uh, something that I couldn't do, that I didn't know a subcontractor that was capable of doing. It was connecting some, some fairly complicated back-end systems to something at a front end with a portal. And, and I was looking around for somebody to do it. And at that time, I went to a networking event, and I, and I met this guy. Some of you in the room will know Mike Parker. He's not a folk singer or a catalogue model, despite the fact <laughs> that that photo would suggest otherwise. Absolute belter. He can't stand it, which is why I keep using it. I'm just going to leave it up there, a bit of dramatic effect. And um, so Mike's a computer scientist, engineer, programmer, whatever you want to call him, but he's ridiculously smart. And he knows it, actually, but um, hence the pose. Uh, but he's, uh, he is a smart guy. And, and I met Mike at this networking event, and he was starting to think about leaving his very well paid job and wanting to do his own thing. And he said, do you fancy uh, kind of going out and having a chat and I'll buy you a pint. So, uh, and as we know, I like a drink. And he said, I'll buy you a pint if you tell me what it's like to leave your job and, and kind of start up on your own. I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. So we went out, we got on well. I offered him the chance to do this piece of work. He absolutely smashed it. And within about three months, actually, we decided to form Orange Bus. And the idea was, we dropped the IT from the bit I was doing, and the idea was to build a web development agency at the time that was scalable. So this was no longer lifestyle. This was about something we wanted to grow, and we wanted to make it big. We wanted to be the best. Around about this time, I decided to buy another camper van. I sold the orange one, and I bought this one. This was, I bought this in Canada. I never went. I found it on the internet. And again, a little bit of kind of weird luck, but I rang, it came up for sale in British Columbia in uh, Victoria. I rang my wife's mom and said, you've got a friend in Canada. Can you just see if she happens to be anywhere near this van? Which, which seemed like a long shot. Turned out she was literally around the corner, I mean, like three streets away. So she went, that was her on the right, and that was the chap I bought the van off on the left. He's still a friend now. Um, and I shipped that over. And things started happening around this van as well. So one day I parked it on Tynemouth Long Sands, and somebody from O'Neill, which was based in the Northeast at the time, was waiting at the van when I came back to it, and they said, we'd like to hire you your van for a photo shoot. And I said, sure, it's no problem. They said, we've got a budget, it's 500 pound, uh, it's a local shoot, you'll be in and out in a day. And I said, yeah, that's fine, there's only one thing, I come with the van. And she said, what do you mean? I said, uh, uh, nobody else is moving this, it's, you know, it's very important to me, it's on air suspension, it's complicated, it wasn't. And she said, okay, okay, I thought you could say a thing and this is what we wanted, but if that's what we have to do to get it, we'll get it. So they did, that was the photo shoot. Uh, it, was for the, it was shot in June, so obviously it's a snow machine. Um, but what I did beforehand was I spent a bit of time researching what O'Neill were doing online um, beforehand. And then I went and I glued myself to the marketing director for the day. And, and I said, you know, some of the things you're doing, you're sending out all of your emails. All your email marketing is one great big JPEG. And there's loads of offers on it, but if you click it, you just got the home page. I said, we can do that better for you. And he said, oh, well, by all means, probably just to get rid of me. But give us a quote. And I had one. So I already thought of that. And uh, so we got a contract. And this is a massive change for us. This is a huge turning point in our career because we suddenly had a big brand attached to our company. If somebody said, who do you work for? O'Neill, that's that box ticked. We also had regular money coming in. And that was, again, that was really important to us. One of the problems with these vans, though, is, oh, sorry, the British Surf, we co-sponsored the British Surf Championship. So we had a really good, good, uh, good relationship with O'Neill. One of the problems with these vans is that. And uh, that's a genuine quote from my wife, uh, um, probably coasting to a halt on one hard shoulder or another somewhere in the UK. It broke down a lot, and I mean a lot. And one of the times it broke down was another kind of one of these unlucky breaks, if you like. Uh, I was and coming towards Newcastle from the coast on the coast road, and it just suddenly conked out everything, lights, ele electrics, the engine, and there's cars kind of flying past me in the fast lane on the right, and there's cars coming up slip road on the left, and they're all beeping the horns and glaring at me because clearly I'd stopped there on purpose. 
And the one person who didn't glare at me and, and, uh, and try to help was, was a young chap called Harry Volgard, and that was Harry. And Harry, uh, he had a split-screen van as well, and he, so he sympathised. He came and he helped me push it into safety, and uh, he sat with me while I was waiting for the AA. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a racing driver. I said, really? I said, what do you? He said, oh, I, I race in the Seed Cooper R Championship, which follows the British Touring Cars around. I said, well, have you got a website? You know, is there somewhere I can go and have a look at what you do? And he said, no. And I said, oh, but would you like one? I mean, I, why don't we build you one as a thank you for the favour you've done me? And if you don't mind, it, you know, you can maybe stick our logo on your car. And he said, yeah, that's brilliant. So we did. Uh, that was some PR we took. Neither of us really covering ourselves in glory there in that fall. <laughs> Find another one from that shoot. Uh, and Harry put our logo on the side of his car. And you think, well, that's maybe the end of that. But it turns out, actually, Harry was pretty good at this. And he won. He won the series that year. And his reward for getting that was a test drive from the British Touring Car Championship. And the British Touring Cars, it's on ITV. Uh, it's pretty big, lots of sponsors. But because we'd stuck with him for that period, he allowed us to carry on. So that was Harry's car in the British Touring Cars, with orange bus logos on, front and back. And then we approached the team and said, well, we're already doing Harry's stuff. Can we do the team stuff as well? And the team said, yeah, sure, because what you find with motor racing is they want to keep, as they call it, all the dollars on the track. If it doesn't help the, the car go faster, then they don't want to spend the money. So we offered them services in exchange for sponsorship. The team then moved into World Touring Cars. We went with them. That was taken in Portimao in, uh, in Portugal. And we started to use it as an experiment to do things that perhaps clients wouldn't pay us to do. So if we had an idea for a project and we couldn't persuade somebody to pay us to do it, we would ask the touring car teams and say, can we build this? We're not going to do it for anything. We're just looking for some PR. And invariably, they would say yes. There was very little risk to them. One of those things that we did was to broadcast live from the pit lane, for example. And we broadcast live from the pits in every single race of a full season of the World Touring Cars. No, this had never been done before. This is eight years before Periscope and Facebook Live and these things existed. So it was great because it gave us stories and things that we could talk about, as well as the obvious exposure from the brand. That team was then sold, and it was sold into a company that was working within GT Asia and um, the endurance racing in, in Europe. And endurance racing in Europe is kind of centered around one big event, and that's the Le Mans 24 hour. This car actually ran out in Asia, uh, with the orange bus logo on the front and also on the sides. But we had one running at, at Le Mans uh, for two years in a row. So again, we took the opportunity to do something that, we, that really nobody was going to pay us to do. We hadn't built apps before, so we built an app for Aston Martin Racing. Huge brand, and all of a sudden we had them as a client. The following year, we built an Apple Watch app, and the Apple Watch had only been released three weeks before Le Mans 24 hours. So we gave two away as a prize. We gave a couple of tickets away and a pit lane tour. And again, huge exposure. And all of this came, remember, from breaking down on the coast road. At, um, at one of the race meetings the following year, the team moved to Porsche, and we met this chap. This guy's called Dr. Frank Valiza, and he heads up Porsche Motorsport. So Porsche Motorsport is at a different scale entirely to Aston Martin Racing. Um, they have 3,000 race cars on track at any one weekend during the season around the world. And they are also responsible for a lot of the cars that come out of Porsche. Uh, so so track-based road cars, if you like, GT cars and the like. And we met Dr. Dr. Felisa, and I think he was just being nice to us because we were sponsors. But we were interested to meet him at a race, and he had this thing in his hand called the Einsatzplan. And this was his, it means race planner in German, or at least so I've been told. If it doesn't, and there's a German speaker in the room, I'm going to look a bit silly. But um, he kept on referring to this, and it had pen and, and alterations written all over it. And we said, what's that? And he said, oh, it's got everything in it. It's the Bible for the race weekend. We print them out on a Monday when the teams start to leave, and then things change. And he said, well, we could probably build you something that would do that. You could carry it. Everyone's got a smartphone in the pocket. Why don't we turn this into a kind of app? Uh, and then any changes in notifications can be pushed centrally. We can tie it in with notifications from flights. If there's any flight, notifi any flight changes, you'll be automatically notified. So he said, yeah, okay. So we put a price in, we did a deal, and that is being launched, I think, next weekend. They've certainly got the, 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 the kind of first release of it. Around about this time, in fact, that very weekend, this chap on the right, Richard Coleman, 
we were chatting to him. He'd been involved in the race teams that we'd been involved in for quite a while. Richard has absolutely everything you need to make it in, in motor racing. So he's quite posh and he has fantastic hair. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he's proud of it as well. Um, so Richard's a great guy and been a big supporter of ours. And we've helped him. It's been mutually beneficial over the years. And Richard said to us, he said, look, I think I've got an opportunity within Formula One. Would you like to come and meet these guys? And I said, yeah, sure, we'd love to. Where, where do you want us and when? And he said, well, it's, it's a weekend. So we had to work on a Sunday. Uh, that is uh, in Monza in Italy. That's the Paddock Club. Uh, absolutely incredible experience. And we were invited by Force India to go and attend. So we turned up. We had no idea what to expect. And they gave us champagne. Oh, I'm drinking there. Oh, no, beer. They gave us beer and champagne, which is always risky. Uh, and they said to us, we're aware of the work that you've done in motorsport. And we were just wondering, you know, our deal is coming to an end with our current uh, digital partner. Would you be interested in, in getting involved? And we said, yeah, definitely. And we are. That is clearly last year's car. I really need to update this slide. But we, we signed the deal uh, in time for the start of last season. We're kind of halfway through the three-year deal that we signed, and they're actually asking us if we can extend it already. And the kind of culmination of this, I suppose, is that this summer we're doing an event at Covent Garden. We've got 400 people coming. We've got a Force India car, Formula One car, and an orange bus in the piazza in Covent Garden for the day. Um, we've got talks in the evening. The team principal and the engineers are coming along to do it. It's an amazing PR event, and there's no way in a million years we can do that without the association of these brands. And, and these partners. And all of that, again, has come from maximizing, I guess, chance opportunities. And probably turning bad luck to goods had a fairly a big part to play in my story as well. I'm going to leave you with uh, oh, this guy. So I only put this in yesterday because um, I'm reading this book at the minute. I don't know if everybody's familiar with, with Yvonne Chouinard, but uh, he's the founder of Patagonia. If you want to read any story about a guy who's uh, kind of non-conformist in business, this is the one. And the, one of the things I loved about it, and one of the things I think is particularly relevant today, is how he describes how entrepreneurs work. So he said there's two ways you can, you can approach an opportunity. You can look at things very conservatively. You can do forecasts. You can do spreadsheets. You can try and plan everything to the nth degree. Or you can be an entrepreneur, and you can see an opportunity, and you take a step towards it. And if it feels all right, Take another one. And you keep doing it. And you keep doing it until something feels wrong. Take a step back and maybe try again. And I really like that. And I think that's something that we've tried to, to do all of our careers, myself and Mike, in terms of approaching the challenges and the opportunities that we found. So I would highly recommend that book. It's absolutely brilliant. So I'm going to leave you with a Winston Churchill quote. I have no idea how Winston Churchill managed to fend off global tyranny because he seemed to just write really interesting, inspiring quotes. But this one isn't um, something I'd seen, I've actually seen very often, except behind my mum's desk at work. So this is hung on my mum's desk, behind my mum's desk, since I was a kid. And it's something that I think is particularly relevant to the talk I've given today. Once in every person's life, they will stumble across a wonderful opportunity. Unfortunately, most of them pick themselves up, brush themselves down, and carry on as though nothing ever happened. Thanks very much, everyone.